So our third talk of the evening, I'm very excited to welcome Bill Allison. I mentioned at the beginning that Bill is one of the planners of this cloud meetup and uh, the rest of the planners really all got together and said, Bill, we want to hear from you and how you're thinking about cloud strategy at UC Berkeley. So Bill, thank you very much for agreeing to be a speaker as well as an organizer tonight. And we will turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. It's, um, it's funny to be on the other side of the planning and and emceeing podium. Um, but let me, uh, now I get to do the, can you see my screen that I'm sharing thing? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> well, so thank you uh, for being here at this meetup. And so I was gonna talk a little bit about our cloud strategy. And I, I wanted to talk about where the rubber meets the road for uh, that strategy at a large university, because that's sort of my interest and excitement is around building things and making progress and you know, seeing those kinds of things happen. And let's see. Okay, so um, today, administration, instruction, research, they really all require significant computing resources. So it's enabling those activities that's the goal. And so that's why we call our cloud strategy university first. Uh, and when you call something a strategy, it usually implies action, sometimes policy towards some overall goal. So it's ironic maybe that I'm saying that here, but using cloud computing is not our overall goal. Most of us in IT are here to make sure the university runs smoothly, to enable the key work of our academics. Uh, and we also see the possibility for changing the way we work and taking advantages of the affordances of all of these new technologies. And so, so I'm gonna start by, I like this picture. And so I wanted to preface everything by talking about transformation. So if the purpose of IT is to make work easier, transformation is when we rethink the way we work, we improve things, we make efficiencies, and we make new experiences possible. And that's what we've seen in a lot of the talks here. Um, so this transformation is the goal of really all new technology initiatives. So technology is the visible bright shiny object at the top of the glacier or the iceberg but it isn't the hardest part. So the hardest part is changing our long-standing ways of working or how our services are funded, uh, thinking about how do we make better customer experiences, uh, how do we make a more resilient university. Switching funding models from capital expense to OPEX is hard here. Uh, changing people's jobs away from a bunch of repetitive tasks to having them build automation is very difficult here. Uh, but when we can do those things, that's when we get the large return on our technology investment. So that's, you know, the hard part is the part below the, the waterline. That's where uh, the difficulty is, but it's also where the rewards are. So I thought I would share a couple lessons from my department uh, before I came, became our full-time CTO. We took every opportunity to move things to the cloud. So in some cases, like with Adobe, we were along for the ride and the vendors changed their model over time from packaged software to really running it as a full cloud offering. In others, like our campus API service, and John Skelton has presented here on that, we've moved more and more of the stack to the cloud and now they're evolving into microservices and more delivery of RESTful APIs that will help all of our campus developers. Um, our campus mobile solution, Moto Labs, is a software as a service. Uh, it allows a federated management, so our widely distributed groups can manage their own content while creating a coherent, integrated experience for our faculty, students, and staff. And so we saw the trends of students becoming more mobile first, and we also saw an expensive trend of a lot of reduplicative effort of people starting to build their own mobile apps across the campus, which then sort of fragmented that customer or user experience. And so that's the sort of the puck we were trying to skate to. Uh, so, you know, and so we've learned a lot along the way in implementing some of these services like DocuSign is a good example. The technical work is relatively easy, but the actual complexity is not the technology. It's around the processes. Uh, it's sort of how we design that service and how we think through how people will use it, even though we've bought it as a software as a service. So today, more and more units are experiencing COVID-19 as a kind of a forcing function to have to change their old ways of doing things. And because of that sort of forward looking work of that team, today we can move a department's processes almost overnight. 
uh, and that's because of the analytical work that went into setting up that service. And the same really is true for Moto. Today, Moto could play a significant advantage uh, for us in our return to work because of the prior work that was done teeing that up. Um, another example was uh, Berkeley's uh, G Suite. Uh, so at the time that project was talked about, it was talked about as the email and calendar replacement project. So we used to be deluged with calls about um, email not working, and some of us remember the great CalMail outage. Um, and what drove that project and that change was trying to cut costs, address some security concerns around collaborative tools, and, and address our analysis that showed there was going to be a significant growth in email. Now, we had a lot of executive sponsorship from very high up in the university for that, and we needed it uh, because, you know, I talked about the angry emails we would get about email not working. Once we said we were going to change it, we got now two flows of angry emails, the people who weren't happy with it, and then they still also didn't want us to change the status quo and do something different. Um, so, you know, so here you can see the predictions realized. This is a screenshot from our G Suite management console from this week. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you can see the extent of a project's transformative impact most clearly in hindsight. And in this case, uh, the impact of collaboration tools is very clear. There are 56 million documents today shared outside Berkeley. That's not including the ones we just share among ourselves. Um, we have nearly 6.3 petabytes of data in our G Suite. And that big project to migrate to G Suite involved migrating 40 terabytes of email, which felt like a lot back then. So today we let all of our alumni keep their email accounts and all of their documents, their whole undergraduate experience can stay with them and they can continue to draw on it. So we weren't replacing email and calendar. We were fundamentally changing the way work happened at Berkeley. And that's sort of the transformative part. And so um, we're talking about SAS uh, here in this part of the talk and, and, and about process. And so stories like what happened with G Suite and all these are happening all across Berkeley. And so SaaS is kind of the runaway story of cloud at Berkeley. And most of these purchases are not led by IT. So as more and more of Berkeley's technology services are bought as software as a service, our role in IT is it's changing. It has to change to more partnering, brokering, process consulting. Um, it's less about the technology and more about these other parts. And it elevates the need for partnership and collaboration across all the boundaries that we have in our campus and across the silos of our traditional org charts. But uh, it's not really just IT that has to change. So th I love this slide. Um, this shows the dramatic growth of programming jobs outside of IT. So um, this is, and I'm using this with permission from Gartner. Uh, so this shows the dramatic growth of programmers so programmer jobs, while still most of them are IT, the most dramatic growth is happening outside of IT. So while IT is shifting to do more brokering and process engagement, the business side, uh, the academic side of the university is experiencing this push the opposite way. So for them, they have to become more tech savvy for us to experience change as an organization. So they are buying SaaS products and now they are also needing to interpret data and write code. So, you know, what does that imply for our cloud strategy? Um, like the meetup, our cloud strategy sort of started with this why. And so the conversation we want to be having with people at, on the campus is not, you know, hey, what do you want to do with cloud computing? Um, we're really trying to talk to them about how to transform the way they do their research, accelerate the publication of that paper, uh, get into a conference or whatever. And so the strategy itself is written up in a fairly high level document. And it's like seven pages, but these are the high level categories, people, process, and technology. And so that sort of gives you a high level beacon or kind of a North Star for where you want to go and where, where the work lies, but it's not enough because it's sort of too high level. And so, you know, we're fairly resource constrained, so we have to prioritize a lot. Uh, so last year, our uh, cloud focus was on uh, two or three high level things. And one of them was community building. And that, so this meetup is actually part of that. And then do, taking a look at the data center and sort of how the data center and cloud work together. So we use this process to pick what to work on. And then that's still too high level. So we 
have another drill down to tie this high level strategy to actual work streams that happen uh, and we can run in an agile way. And so, you know, it's the, what is the saying, you know, to travel fast, go alone. But if you want to really make a big difference, you've got to go together if you want to go far. Um, so, and we prioritize people because that's what we need to make change. Uh, it can't just be about the technology. Uh, so just to follow through that thread on the, on what we're doing with people, we formed this planning group. I think I see Jason and Amy, you hadn't joined us yet, but we had uh, pulled together a bunch of people and we had a really intentional discussion around what do we want this community of practice to be like? Um, what are its principles? How will we engage people? And we wanted to make everyone feel included and welcome. Uh, and we created the public meetup. The goal of the public meetup is to cross pollinate. It's to energize our IT staff. It's to get parts of Berkeley talking to each other that don't talk to each other all the time. And it's to promote and hear from like the high energy, high velocity stuff that's happening in our uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so, you know, so far we've had 16 meetups. This is the 16th one with almost 50 talks. So it's working, you know, people are getting interested. Our attendance is consistently strong. There was like 50 people here before. Um, you know, and then the two people in the center of this slide, I think, Tim, you're on the, on the meeting now. Uh, I remember this meetup because it was so great. This researcher from UCSF was working with large data sets and having a real problem that was hindering her research in moving them around. And uh, Tim is an expert in Globus. And he said, well, did you try this? And so that's them like working this out. She could leave and, you know, go right back and sort of do her work differently. And so the connections that are forged at this meetup have also led to new job opportunities for people and different organizations partnering together. So it's had a very concrete um, uh, concrete outcome. So then my Berkeley slide here. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the future. So the we talked about the processes when we were talking about SaaS and we talk about sort of the people side. And so now let's talk some about technology and talk a little bit about um, the cloud and the data center. So um, the slide on the left is from a campus survey of our data center. Uh, we we um, reached out to everybody to try to understand uh, how they were using stuff. And you know you can see that the gold and the blue represent research and academic pursuits mostly. We have a small slice of administrative computing, um, and you know in a lot of businesses when they talk about we're going to go all cloud, a lot of times it's like the red slice. And I think actually there are some people in our enterprise apps group who would love to move that whole red slice off into the cloud and run infrastructure as a service for things like PeopleSoft. But when you drill into the blue and gold and stuff deeper, this pie chart shows our challenge. We have demand that is incredibly diverse, incredibly different types of problems they're solving. And so we can't take a really top-down approach. So what are the general trends then? Uh, so this also came out of the survey. And this is, uh, you know, Google gives you the views that it gives you of these uh, surveys. It's not my favorite presentation of the data, but what we were looking to get at is what are the trends in decline or increase in adoption for local server closets, the Warren Hall data center, our main campus data center, our high performance computing environment, which actually resides in the data center, and the public cloud. And you know, the takeaway was uh, local server, so the blue is decline. Uh, red is stay the same, green and, and um, orange are increasing, and purple is like not applicable, like you can't run PeopleSoft on an HPC. Um, so what we saw was everything's increasing. The demand for computing power and storage and stuff is just increasing. And, and it isn't like it broke out, like there were some cloud people and there were some data center people among these groups. It was like everyone wants, um, they want both. And so that, you know, I think is that's one of the challenges before us is to think about how do we orchestrate what compute and what problems get solved where. And so this just real quick is showing the sort of trajectory of our, we have a modest sized data center and right now we're at about 75% capacity and this fiscal year we're going to cross that orange line and we need to expand um, our capacity. So, you know, looking forward, then I think some of the questions are going to be, how do we address that? We obviously have to increase our capacity. 
but um, the blue represents the current working document of what are the things that we need to focus on now. And the difference this year is the data center and the cloud are both on the same line. And so the people that I've brought together represent people working on the data center and people who are working on the cloud because we can't treat them as silos or two different things. And uh, so we have a lot of work uh, to do. And you know, some of the things that I think we need are more data to work with and more that will enable more automation and, and a better, more um, insightful understanding of why people put things uh, in different places or how we can optimize where, you know, if we create new data center capacity, are we just simply adding more of the same or what is the shape of the usage of the uh, different applications that are there? And we have lots of projects on the bullet points too that are sort of things that are accruing now. So I wanted to stop there and uh, I, don't, I think we have a little bit of time to not only have questions, but you know, there's people on the call who are involved in many of these things. And so it would also be fine with me to have um, some discussion about uh, those things. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, let's open it up for questions and discussion. There's a lot here to dig into. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on was just the slide that Bill mentioned there about the data center. So when we, this, this is an interesting forum to talk about this in because when we're talking about the cloud, we've started to think about it in terms of- This one? Uh, uh, well, the Earl Warren data center, but also the one that had increasing capacity, that one, where we were, we were trying to figure out are we all just picking up and moving out to some public cloud provider somewhere, or what is the demand that we see on our on-prem data center? And this was pretty shocking when this came back to us and, and showed the fact that in, uh, you know, of our campus customers, a lot of them still want to increase their capacity over the next one to three years of the Warren Hall data center. So the strategy that Bill's kind of referring to from a cloud perspective is not only trying to figure out what is our footprint going to look like in terms of the public cloud providers that we're going to, things like Amazon, GCP, Azure, but also how are we going to continue to use the Warren Hall data center to support the campus customers that we have that are already on-prem. And that includes our on-prem cloud, you know, our VMware environment, which by the way, we've just, uh, we are just going through a hardware refresh under the covers of our on-prem uh, VMware environment. So that's going to be there for the next three to five years based on the hardware life cycle of the, of the hardware that we've just put in place. Thank you, Walter. So we're starting to get um, some questions in here uh, from the usual, some of the usual suspects. So Ken Lutz uh, asks, what is the strategy to enable the fluid movement of data and compute between on-premises and the cloud? Um, so I think, you know, if only we had a really strong research IT group that could really work on a sort of product mindset with our, um, with the people who would be using that. Search no further, CTO Bill Allison. Yeah, this is on our roadmap for, uh, in part to address this kind of question in, uh, in roadmap for research IT um, this year. Uh, we're gonna really be digging into developing uh, what's the right, what are the right steps for cloud strategies to support research on campus? And because, um, you know, research is such a big um, part of that pie, um, you know, if we can do this with partners, I think we can have a, a solution that meets a needs from the both administrative and the research um, sides of the house. So um, Ken's question is, as usual is a really good one. And we're going to take it up in part in our research IT work this year. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so we have a question from Peter in Padre Island, Texas. Peter, thank you for coming to the meetup. I am. We should actually do a poll next time to see how many um, visitors we have that aren't from the Bay Area. Uh, so I think maybe is hurricane season heading towards that part of Texas. Um, so, but that's a, a very good question and I would break it into two parts. Uh, disaster, rec so the question is, what are you doing for disaster recovery? And I would say that I would tackle this in sort of two pieces and business continuity is one of those pieces. So some of the earlier parts of the talk that I gave, we've had a lot of conversations about what does um, business continuity, in other words, not having the disaster happen to us look like. So that was a big part of our G Suite conversation. 
we were one of the first major universities to strip out all on-premise email delivery. Almost all of the large research universities had their own, even as they were in the cloud, the SMTP mail delivery side of that was still in the data center and there's a bunch of reasons for that. And we had to make some, some of those transformational changes that weren't the technical ones in order to make it so that G Suite would be they would be handling the disaster recovery. They would be keeping, you know, we sort of trust their ability to be sort of in a global infrastructure. Um, but we did have a data center fire and that tested um, one of the weak links, which is um, our identity management was in the data center. And so if you have some things in the cloud and you have some other things in the data center, that really has to be part of your business continuity equation. Um, so uh, today, when there's a disaster or something, we can all get to our G Suite, which is a huge, um, that's a huge advantage. Uh, as, as far as disaster recovery, uh, we have a failover site uh, in San Diego with the San Diego Supercomputing Center. We have um, a pretty significant backup strategy. Walter, do you want to talk a little bit about the how we do backup, say, on the, the VMware ESX stuff? Right. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, it kind of ties in with the whole university first policy here. We don't have a one size fit all policy at this point. I mean, for, for a lot of this, it, it comes down to the individual application that's out there. So a few years ago, when, when we had that data center fire that Bill mentioned, our homepage was actually running out of the data center. So at that point, we thought, oh, let's, let's figure this out better. Now that the, the, um, the homepage is running up in Amazon for that specific reason, so that we can have multiple sites and include that kind of multi-site disaster recovery planning from the get-go. So when we find that we're talking about moving things up into um, the different cloud providers, in fact, we just anecdotally, we had a conversation about that today with, um, in terms of our Google environment, trying to figure out what, what zones would we, we be putting, what, uh, data basically what Google data centers are we gonna be using to host the Google uh, environment that we're gonna put up. And it'll be US West one, and there's one in the central division or central, um, Part of the country. So we try to incorporate disaster recovery now from the get-go when we're talking about these systems and especially if we're making a transition from one place to another like from the data center into a public cloud provider we try to incorporate that conversation uh, at the very beginning. Thank you. Um, uh, Shaz, I have your question and I don't want to put you on the spot but if you could unmute um, tell me a little bit more about what you're asking. So the question is as written is are there other innovative projects at universities that UC Berkeley wants to take on in the area of cloud computing? So. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, really more interested in, do you guys speak with other universities in the realm of cloud computing, application computing, um, and share ideas? And are there ideas that you guys have seen that have come out of those conversations that Berkeley wants to kind of take on? Oh, okay. So absolutely. Uh, there, there are a number of collaborative efforts um, and there's so many. Uh, so sort of on the CIO, CTO, director front, there's the Stone Soup group, which is the common solutions group where we all get together and compare practices across all of IT. Significant amount of that discussion ends up being about cloud and cloud architecture. Uh, there is a, an internet, uh, it's actually an Educause group, isn't it? The cloud there's, there's an Internet2 cloud working group, and so they are, Internet2 started as our networking provider, and they've expanded to um, become a sort of community around some of this and design. Educause, so if you're not familiar with higher ed, Educause, E-D-U-C-A-U-S-E dot E-D-U, is a sort of trade organization for higher ed IT, and there's a cloud working group there as well. Uh, I'm on one task force that's looking at how to get our vendors to give us better training um, because a lot of the training is sort of cookie cutter. It doesn't really address some of the problems that we have. Um, Jason or Amy, do you, like I think there are specific groups that are tied to research computing as well. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure, I could add just very quickly the, um, the Exceed program. It's funded by the NSF is a really, uh, really great uh, resource for researchers across campus. What it basically provides is like over a dozen different computational and data resources for researchers. It's an allocation program. So you can, you can get a starter allocation and kind of get on board really quickly with a, with a, say with a VM, but they have lots of different, they have HPC like in the cloud, they have HPC 
it's a really solid program and one of the um, one of the the, the um, pillars that we have on the roadmap this year in cloud is a fuller sort of rationalization of that program so we can make it easier for researchers on campus to be able to use those resources. Um, so a lot of that a lot of that work is already done and our task is to kind of make it consumable in an easy way for for researchers. Thanks for mentioning like Steve Jason I'll also add the um... CARC, which is the Campus Research Computing Consortium, um, is a, a multitude of efforts that we participate in nationally. And um, they have different fat, uh, tracks. So they have a researcher facing track, data track, infrastructure track. So that allows us to um, really be a part of a community with other folks that are working in this area. And um, of course, cloud is a big topic on those different tracks. And I'll put a link for CARC. And so uh, last but not least, I want to plug in Cloud Bank. That is our effort with uh, UCSD, uh, SDSC, and uh, University of Washington to provide uh, cloud credits and services to uh, all every U.S. university that wants it. And uh, we also have a nascent effort called 2I2C that's uh, hopefully we're going to build on top of uh, Cloud Bank to provide kind of a large-scale educational and research-based uh, Jupyter Hub environments for academic institutions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. All right, Jason, over to you. Okay, so um, yeah, just to uh, offer my own thanks for everybody for joining us. And uh, we'd like to borrow from uh, some great uh, comedy television and introduce a new thing. At the end of our meetups, we are going to have a moment of Zen. And so your moment of Zen today for the wrapping up cloud meetup is a visit to camp verde or cape verde so please hit play and enjoy your moment of zen this is a 4k rendering of images from mars newly posted at youtube um, of course, if you watch it on your own screen at YouTube, it'll look even better. 